coming to you from the Star City. This is Scarlet Fever, a daily Nebraskan production. Well, it's November 15th and I'm wearing shorts outside, so that just means it is a crazy, crazy thing. And it's a Friday. Happy Friday. Pizza Friday, as they say on the radio shows. But this isn't just any old radio show because it's not actually a radio show. It's Scarlet Fever. Glad to have you. Danny and Emma are here. Ooh. Howdy, howdy. Love a good volleyball Friday. I know. Friday. We, we ditched you guys on Wednesday. Um, some conflicts going on and weren't able to get a show together but we're doing it today because and honestly it's probably a better thing that we're doing it today because there's so much to get to so it's a total hodgepodge today and there is a great many things to attend to should be a lot of fun we've had a lot of fun this week a lot of good things happening this week but maybe the best thing happening tomorrow was herbie husker showing up to a volleyball game yeah he needs to leave the hat Keep on. Keep the hat on. The it hat needs so to stay. so disturbing. I've never seen him take his hat off. He's taken his hat off tons of times. But I don't think I'm ever paying attention to it at football because, like, the flyover is going on, and he's like, whatever. Disturbing when you see it. I did not like that at all. It was very concerning. Um, I was I, – I didn't like it one bit um, because it just it just looks so unnatural. It just yeah. – no. Um, but – Herbie Husker did show up to a volleyball game yesterday. That was pretty fun. We'll see if he shows up again on Saturday. Speaking of volleyball, there was a volleyball game last night. There was. Uh, Nebraska and Minnesota, 2v16 in the Broken Chair rivalry, and the Broken Chair is coming back to Lincoln Woo. after the Minnesota football team took it. In August of 2023, it was quite a game. 3-1 Nebraska wins uh, in four sets. Man, I was right again. I said that was going to be a four setter, and sure enough, that's that's what it is. Um, but first things first, huge storyline from yesterday that finally is getting the due diligence that it deserves is Bergen Riley. She made it onto the National Player of the Year watch list early in the week, along with Lexi Rodriguez, and then just went out and proved why she should be on there. 40 assists, 20 digs, four blocks, two of them were solo, and six kills on 12 attacks. Are you kidding me? She's so entertaining to watch. It's actually, like, you just never know what's going to happen when she has the ball. Like, you don't know if she's setting it up, if she's spiking it down. It's, I don't know. She's awesome. Career high in kills for Riley, six. Previous high was five. She actually got that uh, against Washington just a couple of days prior and then also had five again uh, last September in the Purdue game. The 20 digs, also a career high. That previous one was 17. She had 17 against Purdue in October and then 17 in the five-set win against Wisconsin last year but I wrote about this after the fact is just and we talked about it during the games we were both there just how much of a wild card she's become and I talked about it after the game even if she was just a distributor and wasn't so much can do all these other things this team would still be really good but now all of these opposing coaches who are trying to game plan for Nebraska have to think Okay, something might happen on the first touch now. If she goes up and she goes to get it, she might be able to throw both hands up and just throw it down on top of us. Yeah, she makes the team dangerous. Like, not just good, not just like a team to watch out for, but she makes them really unpredictable. There was a play very early in the game. I think it was before uh, even 10 points were scored where Olivia Mauk had a really good, poor reception um, from a serve and it started going over towards the left pin side. So this was first set. Nebraska's on the left side of the court and Riley goes running towards uh, the the scorer's table. So the left pin spot um, where like Murray and Lanfair and Beeson would be playing Um, and Riley goes over there and it looks like she's going to try and set someone up from that spot, but instead she just 
puts both hands up and just boom, mm-hmm. throws it down into no man's land. Nobody's around it. Sends the place into a frenzy. Yeah, no, Devaney was loud throughout the whole game, but especially when she was making those plays, you can tell that the crowd loves to see it. I mean, good luck preparing for her now. I it really you, re- can't. you, like, you can't. <laughs> it's not it's not even fair how well she has just continued to flourish. It's these are all things that you're just not expecting. And two solo blocks itself for that she gets credited for She's everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and sh- it, the crazy thing is that she's about two, three inches shorter than the middles. Rebecca, Alec, Andy Jackson, they're about 6'3. Riley's six foot, six one. Depends on the day. But she's getting up there and stuffing herself. Yeah. And Andy Jackson and all of them, they love to see it. Like, I love when they are so supportive of each other and they just, you can just tell they're excited that. Their teammates are out there doing and showing everybody what they know they can do. And Andy was saying after the game how mm-hmm. she was just going so crazy over the one of the stuffs that she wasn't even paying attention to the next point <laughs> starting. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's it's quite the uh, quite the trend that has started to show up is just how much the setters getting involved, and it's not something that you see all the time. This is one of those rare breeds of players. And this goes back into some of her high school playing days because she was an outside. Mm-hmm. So she has all of this versatility that she knows how to use because her sister set her up in high school. When she played club, she was a setter. Obviously, that's how she got to be the setter that she is now. But she's enveloping all of these other characteristics that your typical outside would be bringing. She's able to manipulate the ball how she needs to when she's in those tough positions she can get up and block that is one of the things that outside hitters need to do is be able to put the block up and get the hands uh, in the right position and she's digging balls left and right if if anything that's the biggest jump that we've seen from a year ago and that's not to say that her defense last year wasn't good but it's just continued to grow as the season's gone along and i I, having a 40 20 game is yeah. Incredible. Yeah, and I really think it's a lot of credit to her because she's not just focusing on one aspect of the game. She's not just focusing on setting. Now she's adding in the digs. She's adding in the kills, the blocks. Like She's adding in so many other elements that she has to focus on and be aware of those opportunity opportunities throughout the game. Speaking of defense, um, continued to show itself yesterday. 12 blocks for the team. First time they had gotten to that mark in about a month. They did that in the road op- road conference opener uh, against Illinois back on October 3rd. But they hadn't been in the double-digit block department for a little while. They had 10.5 against Wisconsin. But that was a huge thing too early on that really started to show itself, not just from Bergen Riley, but from the team as a whole. I mean, Jackson finished with six blocks. Yeah. Alec and Beeson both had four. Mm-hmm. It was really a. I mean, I I was going to put this in my uh, article after the game, but it really was a block party. And then even for Minnesota, they contributed seven on their side. Yeah, and I was gonna say it's so funny that like Nebraska had so many blocks because just watching the game, Minnesota's double blocks last night. Like, there was a couple towards the end where they were just killer. So looking at the stats and, like, seeing that Nebraska actually led is really interesting to me because some of the Minnesota blocks came at just such a perfect time for them. Yeah, they – while they only had seven for the game, they just continued to accumulate as the game went along. They had two each uh, in the second, third, and fourth sets, Mm -hmm. which definitely helped their case. Um, But – the block itself was really good because they were getting a lot of balls that were going slow after the tip and allowing for some very nice digs. Alex Acevedo got a lot of those. Mm-hmm. She also finished with 20 digs. Um, and then there was another player from Minnesota, I think, that also had 20 digs as well. But 19 digs for Harper Murray last mm-hmm. night. That's a new career high for her. Lexi Rodriguez is getting ever closer to breaking the record. I think she's under 150 now. Which is insane. Um, she's 143 is that number. She's she's getting close. She is. Yeah. I think it's 
it's it's obviously going to take some postseason play oh, for 1, for that to um, get broken. Mm-hmm. But there's five games left in the regular season: two home games, three road games. Yeah. You add that if if Nebraska were to make the title game again, win or lose, that's about eleven games left that she has that at maximum. 11 games left that she has to be able to break that record. She has a lot of opportunities. She, but, she, but she needs to average about 10, 11 a game. Yeah, and the hard part is a lot of teams, I feel like, try to avoid hitting to her because she is such a, like, she's just a powerhouse when it comes to getting those digs and those receptions. So I feel like that could also kind of hinder that. But she still gets 16, like, last night. So. And the crazy thing about that, too, is, Nebraska finished with 82 for the game mm-hmm. in four sets. Uh, the The attacks were insane. Minnesota finished with 169. Nebraska finished with 166. Balls were flying all over the court, and while the attack or while the attack errors were not like super elevated, when you're only getting you know 50 kills on 170 swings. Obviously, there's going to be some room for improvement there when you're not finding the floor as often as you want. Yeah. So, I mean, Nebraska held Minnesota to 130, but even after the game, they were like, we hit under 200. It's not where we want to be. But as they've been saying, all year, gritty over pretty, and that's Mm -hmm. exactly what happened. Yeah, eventually, obviously, you always want to play the perfect game, but sometimes you just have to take the win, and that's – what they're down to at this point as they're nearing the end of Big Ten play. They, they took the win, but I think they also took advantage of the fact that Minnesota was also on that Pacific Road mm-hmm. road trip with them. Minnesota started off slow. They did start off really slow, but they lost the previous two games. They played Washington first and then Oregon. Mm-hmm. Washington, by if you want to use rankings because Washington is ranked, they upset Minnesota 3-1. to one. And then the Golden Gophers got swept by Oregon, 3-0, yeah. whereas Nebraska swept both of them. So Minnesota was already coming in on their heels. And you could just see how deflated they were after that first set mm-hmm. when they got absolutely blown up, 25-12. to It looked like it was going to be a slaughterhouse yeah. and, after that first set. Yeah, and I think if you just watched the first set on TV or you left Devaney after the first set, I think you would have been really surprised that it went to four. Because I hope nobody left after the first set. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I would hope not either. <laughs> but yeah, 25 to 12 in that first set. I was like, man, it's going to be a quick night here in Devaney. That's it, what I was thinking it too. It was not, but that's okay. But even in the back of my head, I was like, mm-hmm. all right, the Minnesota's a good team. They've always yeah. been a good team. They know how to battle back from adversity. This is nothing new for them. And sure enough, they did. Those second and third sets. Especially the second set Mm -hmm. looked a lot better for Minnesota. And they came out with a different energy, I think, from the short intermission, the three-minute intermission. Yeah. And you could tell something had just – the flip had switched. They're like, wow, we just got our butts kicked in the first set. We needed – change things when you need to change it quickly or else we are going to get run out of the building yeah and one thing about minnesota is they're a loud team like nebraska has a lot of energy like after points and they hype each other up the team like on the sideline they hype each other up like all of that they have their celebrations but minnesota even up at press row you can hear them the entire time yelling at each other talking to each other so i definitely feel like that picked up in the later sets too yeah one the i think it was the libero who was just screaming for no mm-hmm. reason and i'm looking over to uh enrique or rico alvarez and he's just screaming along with her <laughs> that was quite that that is one of rico's favorite things to do is just try and imitate the players as much as he can but Sorry, I'm not going to be held liable for libel there. So <laughs> don't don't come after me, Rico. I'm sorry if I took that out of context. But it was they they brought a lot of energy and they had to. Yeah. Because the home fans brought a lot of it too. Mm-hmm. They did. They were loud too. Yeah, it was definitely it was interesting because that's just not what I'm used to with Nebraska during plays. Like you get the after, like I said, but during 
they're like you hear every once in a while but most of the time they're pretty like they just know where to go i feel like they can just read each other whereas minnesota is very vocal they are and another another thing to get to don't mean to get off of that but a couple more things we gotta definitely bring up Mm -hmm. uh taylor landfair finished second and kills for the night but on the other side of that nine errors on 45 swings yeah the 45 swings part is an interesting to look at. Registering more swings than Merritt Beeson did, I think, is also something to keep an eye out for. But there's there's two sides to this coin here. First of all, this is the fourth time in the last five games that Landfair has had 10 or more kills. Mm-hmm. So there's progress coming. We're seeing sort of that, like what she could be like we've talked about. but We're starting to see... And I think this is why John Cook left her in there, because as she's starting to, as usually when she's been starting to get towards that, um, hot, towards that watermark of zero for your hit percentage, that's when he starts to get a little antsy. But he left her in there. Mm-hmm. He said after the game that he was trying to let her work to work things out. I mean, she had a she had a good road trip. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um, she she played well. Um, the Northwestern game, she had a bit of an off day, but they were trying to get everybody in there to begin with, so things were already a little different from what they would normally were as they were cure enough to go to Eugene, Oregon for a conference game. Still sounds really weird, but we're starting to see some more consistent production when it comes to the kill numbers, mm-hmm. which is a good thing. But something that I've been really critical about with Taylor Landfair this year she has been heavily reliant on soft touches. Yeah, she likes to kind of tap it over. And John Cook has definitely expressed that he does not like when his players do that very often. There's some players that can get away with it. Mm-hmm. Harper Murray's gotten really good at it. Yeah. But, but she knows you sparingly. Like, right. She she knows when to use mm-hmm. it. And that comes with the experience. And I don't really remember and pardon my ignorance, but I don't really remember Lane Fair doing a ton of that at Minnesota she was a hard attacker and she still can mm-hmm. whip the arm back and slam it to the ground really hard yeah like they're clearly that's something that she can still do but for whatever reason she's not doing it as often as you would like her to do yeah and it's I don't know the soft touches like you said they're just never in the like Harper does it when they're needed but when Taylor does it, it's like right into a block, and it's like okay, well maybe like let's hit through it. I don't know. It just never seems. That was it was especially something that I paid attention to in the Wisconsin game, mm-hmm. and it was something that was pointed out on the TV game uh, on Big Ten Network when I was watching it. Is just how frequently she was going for those soft touches. We know she can hit it hard, Mm -hmm. and I like how you brought up oftentimes she's hitting it into a block. She tries to, like, push it over Mm -hmm. the block. But it goes right in. And a lot of times it does, but I think what she's trying to do is, and using the fact that she's six foot five, to be able to get it over the block and try and get it to someone in the back row who's got to come up and go dive for it, Mm -hmm. oftentimes... When she's on the left side like that, yeah. it's usually not going to be a libero or a defense or a defensive specialist. It's usually going to be someone whose forte is outside attacking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that makes me wonder if it is something like she's been practicing. I don't know because she does it a lot. But so I'm like, is it something that she's been like working on trying to get it just over? But we just haven't seen it go over a lot. Another thing too that I think is worth bringing up is Andy Jackson on offense. I The defense has incrementally improved since she had to sit out for a couple games with mm-hmm. an injury. Those first two games back, I remember talking about it on this show that the blocking in her first game back was not good. Mm-hmm. Some of that's just because got a lower body injury. Yeah, got it's hard to get up. As hard to get you. up. Makes sense. Had six blocks mm-hmm. yesterday, so... Progress is being made, but I'm starting to think the teams are starting to figure out her attack. 17 swings and only nine of them have found the floor. Mm -hmm. Did have an attacker as well. I believe that was a long ball. But usually that margin for her is not as wide as it was 
last night. I mean, eight misses, comparing that to like Murray and Landfair, I mean, that's that's not really much, but she's not taking as many swings as the pin hitters are. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's coming on slides or on those quick flips from Riley, and she's trying to get it over the middle, emulating a back row attack. So I'm wondering if some teams are starting to figure out her M.O. Yeah, I'm also wondering if it's just part of like, and I don't know how much this plays a part, but just getting closer to the end of the season and teams have had a lot more time to prepare and look at that film and kind of just know what to expect when it comes to players. Um, And obviously that's not all of them, but that's why I do think going back to Bergen, like I think that's why she's such a good part because while teams might be figuring out pieces like Jackson, Murray, Beeson, whoever, I think Riley's going to be one of those where you can never really figure out. And I'm starting to think that this is, maybe I'm going out on a limb, but Beeson's having a down year. Yeah. she's this. It has not been the year that she's probably wanted. And, I mean, she's one of the leaders of this team. Mm-hmm. Without There's no a doubt, doubt about that. Yeah. Without a doubt. But she's not someone that we've talked about enough in a positive light this year. And some of that, I think, I think some of her spotlight from a year ago has been stolen Mm -hmm. a little bit by implementing more of the middles into the offense. And the fact that she's not a six rotation piece now, because you're kind of having embarrassment of riches with your defensive specialist. Nebraska usually has two out there Mm -hmm. at all times. Yeah. And while a side note, I think we're starting to see. Uh, the three DS lineup is starting to fade to black a little bit. Yeah, I don't think it's totally out of the playbook, but I think we're starting to see less and less of it. But almost always, there's two out there. It's usually it's either Lexi and Laney or um, Lexi and Olivia. Every so often, it's just Laney out there, mm-hmm. and usually it's just Lexi out there. But when they're putting two out there, then you're sacrificing one of your attackers, and usually it's Beeson. Which I think is very interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and I definitely think that plays a part in her low numbers. But also, I don't know. They just haven't been falling as easily for her this year, and I'm not really sure why that is. Like, even when she is out there and her time isn't being kind of sacrificed, I don't know why that is. It's very interesting why this has been the case this year. Um, it's it Statistically speaking, it has been a down year for her. The leadership clearly is still there. Like that yeah. is not wavered. And I'm sure it's a mental battle for her to get through it, but it's a little perplexing this deep into the season that we're not seeing more of these bigger offensive numbers, particularly in the kill department, because that's what she was doing so well last year. She was the go to. Yeah. And I mean, you look at the 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 statistical numbers. I mean, star season high is twenty two against Purdue. That's great Mm -hmm. but on 54 swings and it was a five setter yeah and then most of these larger numbers I mean she had 16 against Michigan but 15 against Arizona State non-con Creighton non-con that was 14 she had 13 against Ohio State and Illinois that was in a six-day span and they were trying to feed her a little bit more 11 against Kentucky and you just keep going down the line it starts to shrink more and more and this is just not where she was a season ago. I mean, we were consistently seeing 17s, 18s, mm-hmm. 19s last year. Huge numbers that she was putting up. I mean, a season ago, most of these low numbers that she was getting in kills, I I think they were you I could count them on both hands and not be able to fill it up. That's but that's something that's happened this year is that I I can't get every every yeah. game on my hands. And I think it's really interesting because this has been a conversation since the beginning of the season when we were like, Beeson and Murray are both kind of starting off slow. Like, we don't really know what's going on. But that hasn't been the case for Murray since. Like, she's been picking it back up. She's been playing really well. And her position has also changed a little bit. Um, And she's been having a lot of those receptions and digs. So that's different. And her numbers have been back up. Whereas Beeson, the conversation hasn't changed. And it's just kind of stayed, I don't know. It's just... Nothing's really changing. So there was only eight games last year where she had 10 or less, and they played, I think it was 34 games, 
last year. Mm-hmm. So quick Scarlet Fever math. I'm not very good at math, but that's 26 games where she had 10 or more. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty good rate, right? Mm-hmm. Don't you think? Yeah. So understandably so. And then this year it's, I think it's only 12 so far. And we are 26 games in now, I believe. Yes, 26. Wow, I'm really good at guessing. <laughs> um, 26 games in, and it's only happened 12 times. I mean, I get we still have a while to go, but she's not getting to that number she did yeah, last year. Yeah, no. It, it's not even mathematically possible. We talked about how much time Lexi has to get to Justine uh, Wongarantis's Diggs total of 1890. Huh, funny how that one worked out for 1890 <laughs> initiative. Um, but Beeson can't do that now. She can't get to that number because there is only 11 games left. If she got 10 or more in the next 11 games, she'd only get to, what is that, 23? Yeah. Wow, I am really good Journalism at Journalism math. math. Wow, Ooh. let's go. Um, she And I don't think she's going to get there. No, I don't need uh, – she had seven last night. On 30, like, 35 attacks. Yeah. 34, sorry. 34, yeah. Almost had that one. So I just, I don't know what's going on. But the one thing I will say that I think is a huge testament to her is despite not playing how I'm assuming she wants to play, um, you never really see that. Like, I'm, you know, you know, she's dealing with, with it inwardly, but that doesn't affect her position on the team. That doesn't impact her, like, excitement for her other teammates when they're doing good things. Like, she, that leadership hasn't wavered. And I think that's a really big, that's a really big compliment to her because that's hard to do. If you're not playing well, it's hard to be positive and it's hard to remain in that leadership position when other people are doing better than you. And, Couple of here's here's another tidbit for you. There's a she's had uh, four games of thirty swings or more. One of them was yesterday mm-hmm. with thirty four. It was the lowest hitting percentage she had with thirty more swings in a game. That includes the Purdue game, the Creighton game, and the Kentucky game where she all had double digits. Clearly, yesterday was an off night for her. Yeah, but the problem that we've been seeing is she's getting the ball. Early on in the season, it was a big problem of she's getting too many errors. Mm -hmm. It was long or wide. Now it's just she can't find the floor. Yeah. But let's let's get to something a little bit. One other nugget though, before we before I get to this next thing, one nugget that you especially paid attention to. This was so was how Nebraska could not side out after a timeout. Yeah, it took them until. Hold on, I have it here somewhere. Um, it took them until the third set, and the score was 18-16. Like, far into the third set, I think. So at that point, I think there was seven timeouts taken yeah. collectively between the two, and that was the first time they sided out. Yeah. And I think they did it the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. I think I had 11 timeouts total, and they did it five times. Yeah. So they improved halfway through the third and then the rest of the fourth set. But it took them a long time. And I feel like that's not something you just, like – pick up if you're just watching the game with your friends but when you're constantly typing like minnesota scores first out of the timeout minnesota scores first out of the timeout you're like okay like nebraska that's not really something that like you normally pay attention to either in the first place but i remember like sitting there thinking about it it's like they're having some trouble siding out after a timeout and i don't remember this previously being an issue Mm -hmm. usually when it comes to side out siding out issues it's on set points, yeah, or match yeah. points, because whatever Which we've talked about a lot, because whatever <laughs> reason, nothing can be easy for them um, when it comes to trying to put the finishing touches on. It's like, no, we have to take the hard road to get to twenty five. Yeah, okay, sure, <laughs> um, but I think this is, I think this is hopefully for them, it's an anomaly. Yeah, this is for them, it's a one time thing, and I have a hard time thinking that this is going to stay this way, but. If it becomes a trend, I think it's definitely something that we're gonna have to take. We're gonna have to watch out for. Yeah, because Minnesota was coming out firing after those timeouts. Like those timeouts mm-hmm. were greatly helping them. Whereas Nebraska, like I remember looking over at you and I was like, they haven't scored first out of any of these timeouts yet. And then I said that, and then the next one they scored first, which was great. Deja vu. But I was like, okay, what's going on? Like this is just it was just random. I don't know. That was a good catch though. Thank you. 
All right. You ready for a bold take that I don't think is no longer bold? Okay. That Big Ten title is going to be determined by Nebraska. Yeah. This no long this this seemed like at the start of the season that it didn't really seem like it was just going to be them. It was going to be a whole lot of other characters that were going to get in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Wisconsin was reloaded. Penn State, best team they've had in a while. Um, Purdue's always there. Oregon's always in there. USC might have a fighting chance from the outside, but all of the beating up has gone below Nebraska right now. I mean, Purdue yeah. was... They were neck and neck with Nebraska until they went to Wisconsin and got absolutely broom wiped. I think uh, they lost the last two sets. It was twenty five to twelve, twenty five thirteen. I think it was in the last two sets. The first one was competitive. The second two, or yeah, second and the third, just were not competitive at all. Yeah. And I think that we are clearly starting to see just how much better Nebraska is than everybody else right yeah, now. Which I think is so interesting because we've been talking this whole season like and they it still is. Like Big Ten is such a hard conference to play in. Like it, it's not it, over. Like yeah. we gotta remember that. It's not no, over. It's still we're still in the thick of it with um Nebraska volleyball and the Big Ten. But I think it's really interesting because after that SMU loss, which I think we keep going back to, but it was like, okay, Big Ten is good. Like what does this mean for Nebraska? What does this mean for the Big Ten title, all of these things. But we've seen them consistently win since. They haven't lost since. How, do you remember the stat um, about, like, this was one of the first sets that they lost in? Do you remember what John Cook said yesterday? Yeah, it was the first set that they lost um, since the Michigan game. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, and, if you, and if you want to get any crazier than that, in that Michigan game, it was the first time they lost the first set of a game since the SMU game. Yeah. And, like, John Cook was like, yeah, it felt weird to lose a set. Like, <laughs> feeling weird to lose a set. Because like, they, they swept all four games on that road trip, which yeah. is insane. Like, that's, like, I don't even know how to explain. Like, that's crazy to, like, feel weird about losing a set. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how else to explain it. But, um, yeah, so I think now they've clearly distinguished themselves as we can, they can get through pretty much anyone at this point i still i'm very hesitant to say that they'll get through conference play undefeated i'm wary about the wisconsin game i know it's at home i'm i am more weary of um penn Penn state State, yeah penn state i am more concerned about um at this point and it's at penn state that game will be the big 10 title Mm -hmm. game i mean it it should be it should be the big 10 title because because okay even if Nebraska loses to Wisconsin next week, yeah, somehow, some way, that means Nebraska and Penn State will be one and two in the conference standings yeah. because Penn State can't overtake Nebraska because um, they have a common loss in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So they'll be tied atop the, top, the conference standings. But... Even if Nebraska loses, they still control their own destiny. Yeah. Because if they beat Penn State, then they win the conference. I mean, Wisconsin has two losses. I mean, yeah, Wisconsin's not out of it, but they do need help mm-hmm. to be able to do that. And the first thing they can do is beat Nebraska next week. Yeah. It's I'm excited. I think that game's it's going to be a good game. That game is going to be bananas. But it doesn't seem like this is facetious anymore to think that Nebraska can do it yeah no it's definitely not going to be handed to them it's not like no not at all yeah no it's not they're waltzing through the rest of the season but it's not unrealistic it's not crazy like how at the beginning of the season it it doesn't seem crazy but i think it is realistic and the reason why i think it is as realistic as it is is yeah they've won 22 games in a row which is unbelievably mm-hmm. impressive yeah. in itself and the fact that they've gotten this far in a conference play without losing a game but 17 of those 22 games have been sweeps including yeah. all four games on that road trip and that's huge like I think I've talked about confidence a lot but sweeping on the road against ranked teams that's a big deal and again in full arenas yeah I mean Northwestern set 
an attendance record. Oregon set an attendance record. Washington, who's been ranked for a good chunk of the season, set an attendance record. I mean, all good teams. I mean, Northwestern is in the bottom half of the conference, but you could never count them out. I mean, last year they were very close to being able to upset Nebraska on the road. Yeah, no, home advantages are not just football. Like, volleyball is proving that they're going to sell it out. They're going to do everything. Like, fans are going to do whatever they can to give their team an edge, like, quite frankly. Well, Nebraska's got another home game tomorrow night with Indiana, 7.30 local time, and that should be a pretty fun game, too, because Indiana's been pretty solid this year as well, Mm -hmm. and we'll reflect on that a little bit more next week. Let's get to... A little Nebraska ball because we are now two weeks in and it is time for the big weekend at the historic Sanford Pentagon. Uh, the women's basketball team will be playing South Dakota on Saturday night. They will be the home team with playing in South Dakota. So weird how that one works. Um, and then the men's team will be playing the St. Mary's Gales on Sunday afternoon at high noon. The rest will also be the home team for that one. But let's start on the men's side, especially when it came to that Saturday game against Bethune-Cookman. It really looked like, okay, looks a little little shaky here. Okay, yeah. yeah, it was it was a little concerning to see it be as close of a game as it was. And then FDU comes in on Wednesday and they just run the table. Yeah, eighty-six to sixty was the score. It really wasn't close to begin with it was 45 25 at half this this game was in the bag to begin with and this even comes with Braxton Mia not playing he was on the injury report for for the game but I was very surprised to see Juwan Gary leading in points Mm -hmm. I was scared by the fact that Bryce Williams shaved his beard off I thought he was just some recruit that (laughs) pulled up to play street basketball I was very confused um but if there's one thing that has become a little bit more alarming as the couple as we've gone through the first couple of games is the three point shooting. Yeah. One yeah, twenty five percent. Not great. Um for last game. And yeah, right from the FDU game. Mm-hmm. So and I'm not upset about guys like Connor Siegen, Joan Gary taking those shots. They're trying to find this year's version of Kese. Yeah. And I think they're still trying to figure out who it's going to be. I, yeah. I don't know if you can, like, you're not going to get what you had last year. No. And and that's what, I, that's what I hope is not happening because this year's team needs to differentiate itself from last year's team. Yeah. You can't pretend to be another team or, like, even last year's team. Like, you're a different person this year even if you played for Nebraska last year. So, uh. I was pretty pleased with how Burke uh, Buchenshell played mm-hmm. uh, on Wednesday as well, stepping in for, for Mia, seven boards, led the team in that department. Everyone was grabbing boards, that's that's for sure. So that was pretty impressive. Um, Gavin Griffiths, once again, banging threes off the bench. I think that's the role he's going to be playing this year. If you want, a, want an equivalent to that, Gavin Griffiths is, is going to be your Logan Nisley, which yeah. we'll get to the women's team in a couple of minutes. But I think that's the role he's going to be is to try to provide that spark off the bench. And Aaron Uless, mm-hmm. finally getting some chances to play. He picks up eight points as well. He played very well. Um, I think that the Ben and I like to use the flag on the flagpole analogy. We use it a lot with football, but I think I'm going to bring it out here with the basketball team. Yeah. Despite them going 2-0, I think that the flag was about a third of the way up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. I, I'd, I'd say about a third of the way up. I think we're bringing it back down a couple of rungs now. Yeah, I agree with that. It was, it's not time to panic. No, it's not time to panic. Three games in, 3-0. Right. And if Nebraska can be competitive against St. Mary's and Creighton over the next couple over the next week— and stay in the games, even if they lose both of them. Yeah, they have to be competitive. If they're getting blown out, that's a problem. Yeah. But if it's a five-point game, mm-hmm. the final score, that considering how it started and the expectations that the team came into the season with, then, okay, 
that fine. Yeah. I am I going to be happy about it? No. A loss is a loss, but if you can keep it close, then I don't think that flag goes up too much. This this is going to be a, a tough stretch that they're going through early in the season where they're still trying to find their identity mm-hmm. with I'll use, I'll use Bigelow's analogy again, a bunch of strangers coming into play, pick up basketball in the schoolyard. That's what it is right now yeah. until they get probably six, seven games under their belt. They're still trying to take a second. They're still trying to figure it out. It's a lot. They bring in a lot of guys who are good in their own right, and they got to learn to play with everybody else. Yeah. I mean, you're bringing in players from across the country. I mean, Williams and Gary are your starters, but Asijan comes from Wisconsin. Buchenshell comes from the West Coast, and Raleigh Worcester comes from Utah. Yeah, I think that's something that's really hard about getting players from other schools, and like in any sport, but every team and every coach has their own ideals. They have their own way of coaching, so I think it's really hard when you bring all of these players in and then try to force them under your like your own ideals, your own standards. I think it's hard to get used to. Sorry, I was blanking on where uh, Burke came from. It was from UCLA. I, I don't know why I couldn't think of it off the top of my head. But he comes from UCLA, strong brand of basketball there, but your role players are not exactly guys that played a ton last year. Even, even Aaron Ulis, he he couldn't play at all last year. Mm-hmm. Um Going out there and getting a solid twenty minutes. Gavin Griffiths coming from Rutgers. Like you got guys coming from all over the place, and they got to learn how to play with the people that have already been here. Yeah, it's hard. I think that this game against St. Mary's on Sunday is going to tell us a lot. Mm-hmm. It's basically going to be a Nebraska home game, even though it's going to be in Sioux Falls. But this is the best competition they will have faced this year. Yeah, I mean, even though St. Mary's is not ranked at the moment. Um, they're a really good regular season team. Yeah, they don't fare too well in the playoffs, but they are really good in the regular season. They love to upset Gonzaga. Happens all the time. There's a reason that St. Mary's is either one or two in the West Coast Conference mm-hmm. tournament at the end of the season. They're good. Yeah. So, and then Creighton, Creighton's always good. Eh. So they're gonna yep. be. That's gonna be a tough one. And it's like home state rivalry. Well, it, it'll be all Creighton fans. Yeah. Oh yeah, but like still, <laughs> like the competition between the teams, though. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's flip things over to the women's side real quick, as they will go play South Dakota on Saturday night. But they played uh, Southern University on Tuesday. Huge win there, eighty-four fifty-eight. That was a very good game to see. Mm-hmm. Um, Lexus Markowski leading in points after a slow day against southeastern Louisiana. She puts up 22, makes a couple of threes as well. Yeah. Hadn't taken a three all year until Tuesday night. She made two of them, in fact, actually. Wouldn't you know about that? Natalie Potts with another double-double, her first of the year, 12 rebounds on 17 points. Didn't take a lot from three, but was still able to work pretty well. Um, and I wrote about it after the game. Just We, we mentioned how players taking strides like on the volleyball team with your freshman to your sophomore year yeah of nebraska's freshman on the women's basketball team so that's Potts, nisley petrie and i'm definitely missing another one um but of those three primer of those three Potts clearly clearly i mean she she was co-freshman of the year last year yeah so there's a she, reason like she was good last she year. she was good last but. year but the improvements that she's made is just like wow yeah it's like when you're good last year like i feel like we can also talk about berg and riley with this because it was like well she did amazing last year but it's like when you're good last year and then people are noticing your improvements your second year like they're big improvements like if you're already good and people are like wow she's playing awesome like, you have to be doing big things for people to notice that, I feel like, because then eventually it's just what's expected out of you. Birde Rimdahl looked really solid again. Another th- double-digit performance. Mm-hmm. Didn't really do a lot. She, she didn't even take a three-point shot, which is not really her game. And Amy Williams talked about it after the game, how like this it was a little strange not to see that. But she did very well pulling up from inside the arc, outside the paint, and going with some mid-range shots. But a couple things that I think we need to put on notice here. Britt Prince, another slow game. Mm-hmm. Didn't play against Southeastern Louisiana. I don't think she's – I 
think she didn't score her first points until the second half. Hasn't made a three pointer yet. Yeah. Missed. Her her game is not. She can shoot the three, but it's not her her main game. Mm-hmm. That's not how it was in high school. But she is a three point threat, and she's basically stepping into Jazz Shelley's role. As Ben said last week, Nebraska still has to find who their Jazz Shelley is going to be mm-hmm. because she was the go to last year. Yeah, is it going to be Britt Prince? Maybe, because it's it's got to be someone who's not on your front uh, on your front court. Mm-hmm. It's got to be someone who's an exterior shooter. When you need a three, that's who you go to. Is it going to be Prince? Maybe. I'd argue right now it's Natalie Potts. Yeah, I would too. I mean, I feel like it's hard. And yeah, we're just three games in. Yeah, but. <laughs> I was going to say it's hard because we're three great, three games in and Prince is a freshman. So it's like I feel like it's going to take her a second to get get warmed up, get into it, and then we'll start to see things flying maybe. But right now I wouldn't go with her because she hasn't made a three like and fortunately for prince like she's gotten bailed out yeah by her teammates so she's been afforded the chance to go out there and kind of learn on the job mm-hmm. which if is you what will. you have to do right and i think there's a bit of wiggle room there for Britt prince but it'd be nice to see a little bit more mm-hmm. out of her to start i mean this is someone who's one of your highest recruits that you've ever had in program history expectations are high for her i can't imagine that she's feeling too much of it right now it's very different from like your first two football games yeah if you're a freshman phenom aka dylan rayola i mean they're playing some just mid-major schools right now yeah so you have the chance to get yourself going and that's where i'm a little con- just a little bit concerned if 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 this is just her trying to get her feet wet and maybe something's up with the ankle Mm -hmm. that kept her out last week i mean then okay fine yeah i'll I'll live with it but if if it becomes a trend then i'd get a little bit concerned because she is such a big part of this team yeah i think it's hard we don't know everything going on we don't know injury we don't know what the plan is but i would like to see more out of her and I think that if she is given some more time, she should she could be really good. But we'll see. We'll see who that Josh Shelley spot goes to. Another thing, too, to keep an eye on is Allison Widener. Mm-hmm. She only had three points in 15 minutes on, on Tuesday. Some of it is probably getting her back up to game speed again. I mean, she didn't play for basically a year and a half yeah. in, in actual competition that counted. So, also some wiggle room there for her. But, on the flip side of that, we know what she's capable of. She was a double-digit average scorer before she got hurt in the 13 games that she played in 2022. We know exactly what she brings to the table. Yeah, she had a double-digit performance against Omaha, but Omaha's not good. Yeah. It hasn't been there the last two games for her. I'm not ready to raise the alarm bells yet, and this was one of the things I put in my column after the game. Mm-hmm. I'm not ready to put the alarm bells on it for her because she doesn't deserve that for everything yeah. that she went through. It's hard there, coming back from injury. There, There is some grace to be put there that she deserves, and I might be jumping the gun a little bit on it with calling her out, but there's an expectation now. She's one of the leaders. She's a redshirt junior. Mm-hmm. This is not new for her. Yeah, you've gone through all sorts of things with both of your legs yeah and you were out for a year and a half basically but there are expectations there for her we know what her and she has expectations for herself i'm not really sure what her role is going to look like going forward because she does not she's not a ball distributor that's what kellen hake is going to be Mm -hmm. and i i was a little surprised to see her starting um to begin the year but after three games, I can totally understand why she is because she is a good passer. Yeah. Um, who will take the shots when she needs to. But Widener is a shooter. That's what she was before she got hurt. I really hope that for her sake, that's not what she's becoming is also a passer because Nebraska needs more shooters. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but if the production's not there, I mean, there are people there clamoring to take a starting spot. 
Yeah, there's a lot of good players on the team. I think it's important to note, though, that, like, she, like like you said, she's definitely putting this pressure on herself, too, because every athlete wants to go out and perform well. Nobody wants to play poorly. So I think it will be interesting after we get a few games in and she gets that rust knocked off. Hopefully she starts playing better and starts starts putting more up on the board. But I think that if something is not starting to materialize by the time conference play rolls around, which, by the way, there are some games the first weekend, or I think it's the second weekend in December. Yeah, it's coming opening up. Opening weekend. It, it is coming. So Yeah, things, things need to be figured out fast. And I'm not ready to – there's no reason to sound the alarm. Oh, yet. no. Three games in, yeah. stuff's going to get itself figured out. It all works itself out. But, but – it is something to keep an eye on. Another thing to keep an eye on is the free throw shooting. Mm-hmm. They had 34 attempts and only made 25 of them. Not great. Yeah. Um, the fact that that number is where it is, is um, I'm not super, super like, oh, no. Like, this is not good. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it is becoming a bit of a trend i i've noticed because i think it was nine free throws they missed against uh southeastern louisiana i put this in my column after the game as well okay here it is um they went 15 to 24 from the line through the first three quarters Mm -hmm. okay they missed uh not yeah was not in southeastern louisiana so Free throw shooting is we, – we like to equate aces in volleyball to free points. Yeah, that's I what, was just thinking this in my head. Ah, I was just thinking that's, this. That is what free throws are yes. in basketball, mm-hmm. free points. You're giving up free points. And I like I was thinking that in my head because I said that so much about volleyball. <laughs> Look at that. And, yes, like free, th- free throws, like – that's I, why they're called free. Yeah, they're free points. And I get, I get that you're going to miss one every once in a while – it's like a kicker in football, like all of us are like, he should make every one. They're, you're going to miss one. You're human. You're going to miss a couple here and there. But I feel like every basketball player will tell you that like free throws, are you're just expected to make them. Mm-hmm. So to see that number be like where it is is really surprising. Yeah, and I wonder if that's also just trying to shake the rust off yeah. as well. But I think it's not something that we can just be like, okay, this is an anomaly now. Yeah, no. It's something that needs to be kept an eye out for mm-hmm. going forward, and especially with Creighton coming up, which they, the women's team is also ranked, um, that's going to be a big thing to keep an eye out for is the fr- is the free throw shooting. Because in the Big – especially in the Big Ten, it is a physical conference. Yeah. And you don't want to give up those free points. Like that – you're missing – what was it, 25 and 36, you're missing 11 points. Like, that's a big that's a big difference. That can be the determination between a win and a loss. It really can, and especially when it's tight games. Yeah. Like, Nebraska will inevitably be playing yeah. down the stretch. Um, another thing, too, that I think is worth noting is throughout the game, I kept uh, – I. Came into Tuesday thinking, okay, what does the team look like when Alexis Markowski is not out there? Mm-hmm. So I act- I actually tabulated the points that they put up when she was on the floor, when she wasn't on the floor. And it was actually pretty even when it came to her minutes. She only played for 22 minutes. Mm-hmm. So what exactly happened? Well, she put up 22 of herself. In the 22 minutes she was on the floor, they recorded 48 points. Okay? Yeah. And then take away those 22 points, they only scored 26. When she wasn't on the floor, the team scored 36. But 14 of those 36 came after she checked out for the last time with seven minutes left. So maybe it's nothing in this game, but I think it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, for, for sure. So there, there's your little nugget there. <laughs> and lastly, football's coming up tomorrow. Score predictions came out. And just as I said, Ben Beecham <laughs> is the only one picking Nebraska this week. I just can't. I don't think. 
there's enough there for me to choose them. I'm not ready for it. I actually d- knocked down my score prediction to 27-24. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be as high scoring as of a game as you and Ben thought. Yeah, I'm not thinking that anymore but. either. But nonetheless, it's Friday. Let's celebrate. Yeah. It's time for the weekend. Hey. Um, big week coming up next week, too, as we will have... A lot of football, a lot of volleyball stuff, basketball stuff will be going on next week too. It's going to be a busy week here for the show as it's going to be a very chaotic two days next Friday and Saturday, but a fun weekend coming up this weekend. Yeah. Football, both sides of basketball, volleyball as well. Sports seasons are starting to clash. Crossover season is a real thing. It is. Okay, sports. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for hanging out on a Friday. We badly needed the friday show yeah it's a good way to end the week it's a, it's a, yeah it is a solid way to end the week thank you for watching over on our youtube stream thanks for watching on apple and listening on apple and spotify if you're watching on apple and spotify that's pretty impressive let me know how yeah i also want to know how to do that um thank you for listening to scarlet fever and we'll see you next time